actual legitimate rabbit serum. Um, they inject white blood cells of humans into the rabbits and they form um, antibodies and we use this as an induction agent for patients that are highly sensitized. So, um, interestingly enough, they can, they can get a serum sickness from the thymol and they present with jaw pain, like excruciating jaw pain. They have fevers, it's called a shake and bake, so they're shaking and, and uh, they're at higher risk if they've had a rabbit. And I've had two patients uh, in the last month that came in with serum sickness and, you know, talking to them in their history, they both own rabbits really weird but um, so again everything's in the history so pay close attention when you're seeing patients if you notice any of these medicines on their list so prograf and cyclosporin these are calcineuron inhibitors tacrolimus is the most widely used medication probably from a transplant standpoint it can cause diabetes and it can cause hair loss a ton of my women come in and their hair is just falling out because it actually interacts with one of the um, hair cycles but Biotin, sorry, you, you want to keep your kidney or your hair, you know, they have wigs, so um, that does happen. Uh, cyclosporin, you can get um, gum hypertrophy, so these people come in and their gums are really fat and thick. Um, they can be hairy, uh, hirsutism, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. Um, Cellcept is another medicine that we use. Um, this notoriously has GI side effects. It's horrible in my di diabetic patients. So a lot of people, they get nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, 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 diarrhea all the time. Um, so we're adjusting these. Prednisone It's the other important one. They get moon faces, so the fat face, uh, emotional instability. That's funny, but it's really true. Some people have psychosis on steroids. Um, and they gain weight. now. I understand weight gain on you know massive doses of steroids in the beginning, but when I have a patient that's five years down the road and they tell me they gained 60 pounds because the five milligrams of steroids are on, it's not likely true. Your body naturally produces five milligrams. So, um, but we see some crazy people from the prednisone. Uh, Rapamine, very very important if your patient's on this, um, it does decrease wound healing. So our patients that are on this medicine, <clears throat> we actually have to stop it for two weeks before their procedure so that their wounds can heal appropriately. I put Imuran on here. It's more of an old drug, but patients do um, still take it sometimes. And you cannot prescribe allopurinol with this medication. It can cause hemolysis. It is very, 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 very dangerous. It's toxic to the bone marrow. So I put these on here just, you know, these are the common medicines that you're going to see. Um, you guys have your own, you know, pharmacology side. I doubt that you'll be tested on these, but you know, just to kind of know is nice. <clears throat> so there are a lot of medications that interact with these medicines. Prograf, most notably, um, we call them stimulators because they induce the enzyme. So the drug's getting absorbed and used up quickly. So the level of that drug is going to be lower. Okay, and so. St. John's wort is a no-no. We get all these weird requests. Can I take, what did I have, like peppermint and um, saffron and all kinds of weird things. A lot of times, no. Just tell them no. Even if you don't know, just say no. Um, <laughs> that's what I do or I ask my pharmacist. Um, Anticonvulsants, so dilantin, carbamazepine, integritol, those can have interactions. Kepra is safe. Patients are, are okay to take that. It's not going to affect their level too much. Um, so these are inhibitors. So these inhibit that enzyme where the drug is used at. Uh, and these increase the level. Grapefruit. No transplant patient can have grapefruit. Period. And you have to be careful because cultivar makes their Bloody Mary with grapefruit. <laughs> and even though patients aren't supposed to drink, you can have it and stuff that has grapefruit. Um, or star fruit, which I don't think many people in America eat, but some of our um, other um, patients that may have a Hispanic or an Asian descent, they you know they, they eat other star fruit, they eat different kinds of things, so be really aware of that too. Um, medications, Norvask, gimlodipine, that is safe. Um, Diflucan, that is safe. So your patient comes in, they have a <clears throat> they have thrush in their mouth or uh, they have some type of yeast infection. Diflucan is safe. It can it can affect the level, but you know, any of these medicines, if you guys are out in practice and prescribing, and you have a transplant patient and you don't know, just call and ask. Usually, the patient is pretty 
uh, well versed and they will call us even if the patient if the prescriber wants to give them you know a bag of skittles they'll call us not really but be aware of what you're prescribing the patient um, Zithromax the Z pack that everybody prescribes and safe so I just put this on here this is a little bit old it's kind of just an estimate of monthly costs of medications uh, I will say that now all of our medicines, except for the Myfornic are generic, so they do cost patients not as much as this shows. But this Valsive right here that we have to put patients on to prevent CMV is very, very, very expensive. Um, some, insurance, some insurances cover it, some insurances don't. So this just kind of shows you why it's so important that the financial side of clearance is, is, is mandatory. Um, this is an overall just looking at costs of transplants. So here you can see the kidney, <clears throat> the total, top, total cost is approximately this much. It's a whole lot of moolah. So um, two insurances um, is very important. Any questions on the cost? Is it 100% covered with the two? I'm sorry? Is it 100% covered with the two? Yes, typically. There are some 80-20s, but yes, typically 100%. Um, strategies for increasing availability of organs. You know, this is a topic of conversation that will go on for forever. You know, what can we do to increase the amount of organs um, available? And these are just some different statistics. You know, the amount of organ shortage, the people on the wait list, yes. I recently read an article that said... Was it on um, Google? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, I can't remember it was. It was a legitimate source. Of it. <laughs> uh, it said that since the opioid crisis, that the amount of transplants has actually gone up. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that mm -hmm. at all? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, we get a lot of overdoses. Um, a lot from the Tulsa area. Um, yes. And are those, like how you said earlier, even though they're a heavy drug overdose, it's usually like a younger patient that's healthier. They're so a much better organ, yeah. Mm -hmm. And not just opioids, but unfortunately heroin, cocaine, mm -hmm. meth, all kinds of stuff. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so this is just a bunch of statistics that you can read through. It just talks about, you know, how, how do we increase the organ shortage? Um, registering more people as potential donors. How many of you guys have something on your driver's license? All right. Talk to your family, talk to your friends. You know, organ donation, while it's a definite personal preference and conversation, um, it's important. Um, and there's not just organs to donate. I, you know, I filled out an advanced directive the other day, and eyes and tissue and lymph and bone, and, and there's a lot of things. And if you watch Grey's Anatomy, you know all the different things that you can donate. So, um, and expanding criteria for deceased donors. So those <coughs> cardiac donors, death donors that we talked about, that's a way of increasing the amount of donors. Um, mostly just having conversations with people, family, friends that you know may not know or be educated about, about this kind of thing. Encouraging living donor awareness. Um, some people are a little extreme, standing on the side of the road holding a sign that says, I need a kidney, um, but you know, that's their way of getting out there, letting people know that you can donate an organ, you don't have to know somebody. Um, so training for dialysis patients about how to approach their families and the possibility of becoming, you know, living donors. I have a lot of people that I see and one of the questions we ask is, you know, do you have any living donors? No, no, I, I couldn't do it, I couldn't take an organ from my, you know, daughter or sister or brother. And that is definitely their decision. Um, but also some of their, family members might not realize, you know, that it is safe, that you can safely donate an organ and still live a very productive life, as long of a life, and have no problems from it. So, having that conversation. Um, I do not think this will ever happen in my lifetime, but providing compensation and incentives, it's a conversation. So, um, and then, this is really important, the medical system needs to improve and expand end-of-life planning and advanced directives. I mean, <clears throat> how many of you guys have one? How many of your, you know, relatives, siblings, significant others have one? You know, talk about it. 
So I want to talk about primary care and dialysis patients because in the past, really primary care physicians would just turn it over to the transplant team. But now, I mean, we follow these people for the rest of their organ, the life of the organ, and they're in small towns, and they're in other states. So there's responsibilities that primary care providers have, and some of you guys are going to go work in those, and you, you've got to, you know, be competent in, in things that are important for this patient's life, okay? So aggressive blood pressure medicine. Again, um, I usually don't see too many primary care physicians adjusting blood pressure medicines on transplant patients, and that's okay. If they do, they usually call, but... You know, at least being aware and contacting the transplant center if the patient's not smart enough to do it, which does happen, um, if their blood pressure's been under control. Because the three things I tell patients, your weight, your blood pressure, and your blood sugars are going to give the kidney the longest life. Okay, so tight blood, blood sugar control in this um, next bullet point. Uh, we talked about ACE inhibitors. So they can reduce the amount of protein in your urine, and they can reduce the progression of kidney disease. But it is very important, pre, period, initial, post-operative, they should be avoided, okay? You have a patient that comes in, just in general, that doesn't even have a transplant, and they have an acute kidney injury, and they're on an ACE inhibitor, you should probably hold it, okay? Um, so be very careful with this medication, lisinopril. Um, smoking cessation. Have that conversation with your patients in the primary care setting, if they want a kidney or if they've had a kidney. Also, THC. It's the cool thing to do. I don't know. We have patients that that do that prior to transplant, and uh, it's kind of a gray area. It's not an absolute contraindication to not transplant somebody. Is it a dependence or a habitual use? Yes, absolutely. Is it a recreational or a social use? Then we sit there and argue about it. You know, so there are consequences to doing that. So have that conversation with them, and then just general health care. Uh, mammogram, pap smear, exercise, prevention, uh, risk for falls. <clears throat> uh, the biggest thing with females is there's a lot of teratogenic medications that we have to put our patients on after transplant. And so we have to have the conversation. Do you use contraception? Do you use backup contraception? What is your plan? <clears throat> they, can have, they can get pregnant and have a child after transplant, but it is dangerous. And there are steps that we have to take to stopping medicines, making sure they're flushed out of the system and following you a lot closer. Advanced directives, what I had talked about, diabetes care, sleep disorders. So this is all stuff that you're going to see in the primary care setting that you should be addressing with patients anyway, but definitely if they've got kidney disease and, and, and want a kidney and want to get the most out of that organ. Um, limited exposure to nephrotoxins, so uh, CT scans with contrast, NSAIDs, ibuprofen, Aleve, I don't know why, but if any of you guys need a leave, they send me, I have like 10 boxes of it, which I'm not sure why they send a transplant PA, but that medication, you know, it's important to monitor in a patient's bed list. Um, and you guys can kind of, immunizations, that's huge. I don't want the flu shot, I'm gonna get the flu. That's not true. Um, and interestingly enough, they now have a vaccine for shingles that's not live. So we do recommend that any live vaccine our patients cannot get. So again, I talked about primary care role. You're looking at their lipids. You're looking at their triglycerides. Blood pressure. Um, we talked about appropriate blood pressure medications. Usually calcium channel blockers are the first line. Amlodipine or mask. Um, your beta blockers might be next. Core A um, And then, you know, you get into the diuretics. <clears throat> so this is just stuff for you guys to read through that's important in general for your knowledge, but especially for a transplant patient. Obesity. So important things to know. Organs for transplant are a limited source. Less than 1.5 of all deaths are suitable for organ donation. That's a pretty small amount. Every 10 minutes, someone's added to the national transplant list. This is for any organ, not just kidney. Waiting is the hard part. On average, 20 people die each day in the U.S. waiting for a transplant. One organ can save eight lives. Not all transplants work. Rejection can happen. And medications are taken for the patient's life. So, um, I'm going to show you this video here in a minute, but I want to just talk about, you know, when I see a patient, we're a transplant center, so we want to do transplants. It's our job. 
But any of us in medicine are taught to do no harm, first and foremost. So I have to have, and my providers have to have, really difficult conversations with these patients and their families as to why a kidney is not going to provide you, you know, any better quality of life. After 60 to 65, kidney doesn't offer any more years of life. Okay? It simply offers just a better quality of life. But that's not so for every patient. Um, some of these patients, and you know, being in it for five years, I see the bad, the really bad side of things, and I see the good. And so I use those examples to try to talk to patients about, this is a major procedure. You're going to be on medicine the rest of your life. You're at risk for infection, you're at risk for blood clots, your functional status is horrible, you can't even get up on this exam table. How are you going to be able to walk when we need you to walk? Um, and so we have to outweigh the risks and the benefits. And that's why it's a multidisciplinary approach. That's why there's 20 to 25 of us in the room having a conversation about these patients. Um, for some people, it's better to see a nurse three times a week on dialysis. Um, for other people, transplant is the better option. And sometimes there's kind of a gray area. And these patients know and they take a risk um, getting an organ. And there's not an age limit. Um, we transplanted an 88-year-old many years back. We transplanted 78-year-old, 75-year-old. Um, so there's not an age limit, but it's very, very patient dependent. And there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of different people that evaluate this person to make sure that they're a good candidate. So, any questions? Yeah. Um, so Dr. McNeil said that you don't take out the old kidney because why would you? <laughs> so can you explain like yeah. why? Well, when we transplant the kidney, we actually don't even see their native kidneys. Um, a lot of times they just atrophy and shrink and they cause no problems. They don't cause the patient pain, they don't cause infection, they don't cause anything. They just atrophy and die, okay? Um, there are very few times that we do take out the the native kidneys. One would be polycystic, so that's a patient that has huge kidneys, and we know that after transplant, we're going to take them out. Probably six months to a year down the road, but they're so large that, you know, the patient this little and their sides are sticking out, it's uncomfortable. Um, we have taken out native kidneys if they have chronic infection in them. So sometimes they get chronic reflux, so their urine refluxes back into their native ureters, and it's chronically infected. And these patients are already on immune suppression anyway. So it's a really delicate conversation with the patient and the surgeon because it's a big procedure. I mean, it's a, a, a bilateral nephrectomy is a huge incision up through here, okay? But it's, it's too risky to take out the native kidneys for no reason um, at the time of transplant. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Yes? It's kind of a sad story, but um, a part of mine from high school, I'm not exactly sure this is probably five years ago, what kind of type of kidney disease he had. I think it's something that he's had that was congenital. He may have been kidney, I'm not sure. But um, he found a match, and this is what it was his wife. Mm -hmm. So they had the transplant surgery, everything went great. I don't remember how long after, it might have been a week, two weeks, or something like that. He ended up developing a blood clot mm -hmm. and it turned into a PE. Mm -hmm. And then he died. And I was like, seriously, you. You survive the surgery, your wife survives, everything's great, and then you get dying of a blood clot. So he was a big guy to begin with. Yeah. He's a very tall man and a kind of heavier set guy, but I was like, that's just horrible, you know? He got his second chance at mm -hmm. life, and then he's going to die of a blood clot. So would they take whatever organ they, or the kidney they gave him and give it to somebody else? You cannot do that. Um, the other thing that kind of has been on the horizon is hepatitis C. So they have 98% cure for hepatitis C now with pills. So a lot of times a patient that has hepatitis C, it actually plays to their advantage to not treat the hepatitis C because they will wait less time on the list for a hep C organ. And once they get transplanted, then we send them to the hepatologist and they get treated and cleared. So. Yes. How many surgeries do you do on average? So, our fiscal year, which is July to July, I think um, we're coming up on, we're doing two organ, one tonight, one in the morning. I think that will be 99 and 100. So, we do more transplants than the other three centers combined. We do a lot. 
Um, and there's not really a certain amount each week because they're unplanned surgeries. Um, but we've done four in a day, we've done seven in a three-day period, and then there's been two or three weeks that we haven't done any. Um, typically our living donors are scheduled on Mondays, um, and I would say about two out of the four Mondays in a month um, we do one. So our volume is very high. And you can imagine, you know, these people see us in clinic one to two times a week at the beginning, and we see all of them for the life of their kidney. So it's a very, very busy um, office. Have you guys talked about how many needs actually been in No. <laughs> I know. No. Okay, I'm going to show you a video. It's really cool. Don't cry. I have been on my route four, and I go in the morning and deliver packages to, and then in the evening, people who have dropped off their packages at the UPS store, I pick up. He would come and drop off packages. I would help him load and load the truck. And then he started not being there as much, and I started asking, you know, hey, where's, where's Greg? You know, is, is he not here anymore? And, and the next thing you know, um, he's gone again, and, and he goes and gets tests done, and he comes back and says, I'm, it's kidney failure. Sometimes we don't really ever identify what happens to somebody's kidneys and that's what happened in Greg's case wound up on dialysis and needing a uh, needing a transplant the longer you're on dialysis the sicker people tend to get dialysis accelerates aging okay so every year on dialysis may be like getting two or three years older he would ask me well what do we have to do to, to get you better I said well I need a kidney transplant and I blow him off a couple of couple, two or three times. And uh, one day he said, well, hey, what do we have to do to get your kidney transplant? I just wanted to help. I didn't know how to help him. And, I, and there's got to be something I can do. Well, basically, a living donor is a, a, a very thoughtful and altruistic person that wants to come forward to donate one of their precious organs to somebody in need. We have two of a lot of things we don't really need, but we have a backup and you're able to use that back up in select cases if you're a good, healthy person to give, you know, the gift of life to somebody else. You can not only impact, you know, the quantity of somebody's life, making them live longer, but also the quality of their life from being not hooked up to a dialysis machine three times a week. I was nervous. I had spoken to my wife about it, and all I remember is the conversations leading around. If this is what I am supposed to do, then why well, try to hinder that in any way? And um, everything went to me waiting for Greg and his um, year-long process of getting healthy and ready for some sort of surgery um, for a, to be a recipient. He had, um, they needed to get his health up to a certain level. They needed him to have a, um, a financial requirement for recovery after, for medication after surgery. Mm -hmm. I kept in contact with him about every month, and then I got the phone call. And he called me and said, man, everything matches up. Uh, they were scheduling a stress test. And that's when it really, it got real. I've done this surgery now, you know, over a couple hundred times for a donation, and uh, Every time I treat it like it's the first time because uh, I think it's there's so much writing on it uh, that we want to make sure it's perfect every time we do it. <laughs> you know, I've been saying they're you know sweating and getting the kidney out and trying to make sure everything's perfect during the operation for three hours, and finally it's like a sigh of relief. Okay, I'm done. I can walk this baby down the hall. <laughs> when I finally started to really come out of the anesthesia and be aware of doctors coming in, medic, you know, medica administering medication to me, and then I look over and Greg's standing at my door. Good, baby. <laughs> 
That never gets old. That, really, the whole process, living donation special, does not get old. You know what's amazing is um, uh, the recipient that gets a new kidney, they've got, you know, a decent size incision, six, seven inches, you know, in length, but they wake up the next day with an incision and they, you think they should be having a lot of pain, but they feel like the fog has been lifted out of their head because dialysis is pretty good, but it's not as good as one of your kidneys. I couldn't believe how, how good I felt. It was, it was the beginning of, to a new life, a uh, new me, I finished school. Um, um, I have a career now. I'm able to take care of my family. I'm having as much fun as I can have. Sometimes I walk down the hall while I'm, while I'm at work and, and I just get this feeling of joy. And I'm like, Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you. My wife said something during the whole kidney donation process um, that, really, that really meant a lot to me. She said, that if people matter to God, then they should matter to me. And that's kind of been, that stuck with me. It doesn't matter if you know them, it doesn't matter what team you root for, it doesn't matter what color you are. It's just, they should matter to us. I always tell everybody, this is- We got a new brother. brother. Yeah. So, I used to have four, now I got five. He's part of the family. life-saving organ it is very precious and um, it's I never imagined ending up in transplant but it's definitely a passion and I love it and um, probably why I put so much information on the slides Sorry about that. Um, so if you guys are interested or have any questions just feel free to email. All right. Thank you.